We're live. Hello, everyone. I'm Francesca Sisto, the Vice President of the Italian Society. And today we'll be interviewing Tiziana Andina, Professor of Philosophy of the University of Turin, Director of the Research Center Lab Ond, and author of multiple papers and books. Welcome, Professor Andino. Welcome. Good evening. Hello. It's a pleasure having you here today. For me too, it's a great pleasure to, to have the possibility to talk with you and with the students of the Italian uh, university around, uh, around the world and in the, uh, in the English-speaking context. Thank you. Um, so we can start. Yeah. Uh, here's my, my first question. Um, so you've worked in several countries like Italy, of course, China, the US, to name just, just a few of them. And I was wondering, what's your opinion on the cultural and economic situation of China at the moment, uh, especially after the pandemic? Because things are changing in the country and we're starting to see the changes um, in our economy as well. And also would like to ask you, what can we learn as Italy from, from it? And what can the US as well learn from it? Well, yeah, it's, um, uh, it's inter an interesting and, 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 uh, and complex question. I mean, uh, I'm not an expert in uh, international geopolitics, but uh, um, it is certainly true that uh, it is enough to take a trip to China uh, to, real, to realize that uh, that country and more generally uh, that part of the world is an area of great growth, both cultural and economic. Just before the pandemic began in 2019, I made uh, several trips to China, including Wuhan, Nanjing, Beijing. Um, the university in those cities are great. And in general, China is investing, investing um, really heavily in research and development. That means um, it's producing knowledge of the highest quality that can compete with the best university in the world. And I think this is a, um, a thing that, uh, in fact, uh, we are perceiving, we as, a, as, a, as a Western countries, we are perceiving now. If we add to, the, to this a sustained demographic growth, like the situation in China, we can easily understand the reason for China's great development. Um, there are obviously many things about China, Chinese political and social model that Western citizens could not accept. But I believe that uh, as Italian, we should go back to thinking about uh, a couple of things, which, which are, I think, uh, particularly important. First of all, about the role of the state uh, in managing our economy, uh, which must become more central than now, in my opinion, and in directing the development, the, the development of our country over the next 30 years. Secondly, about how to design our society in ways that will make it sustainable for future generations. This is a, um, a concern that is very central for uh, Chinese people and Chinese government as well. I believe these are challenges that Italy, but the Western in general, will face in the coming years. These are all issues on which China can probably teach us something uh, particularly important. Great, uh, that's amazing. And I'm gonna ask you the second question, uh, which is more related to philosophy and art, because you you um, wrote a lot of papers on this topic and you also teach um, this subject. Um, so I watched an interview where you stated that art and philosophy somehow clash. So why does this happen? And could you give us some examples as well, this situation? Mm -hmm. And do you think that something can be done to strengthen their relationship some, somehow? Mm. Um, yeah, uh, I would say 
I would say this, uh, um, the relationship between art and philosophy, as you probably know, because you told me before that you are uh, interested in philosophy and uh, you like to read philosophy, but the relationship between art and philosophy is an ancient one that goes back to the origins of Western culture. Um, in particular, it is, a, uh, it is philosophy that uh, often undertakes uh, to define the nature of art. Everyone remembers the definition, or I, 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 I think uh, every student, which is confident with philosophy, uh, remember the definition that Plato gives of art in the 10th book of the Republic. Art produces copy of reality. Plato's meant that uh, a painted bed, this is an example very, very clear from uh, the book uh, Tent of Ten of uh, Republic. Plato meant that uh, a painted bed, bed is a copy of a real bed, which in turn is a copy of an idea of a bed. Uh, while ideas are perfect objects, work of art are the most imperfect objects imaginable because they are copy of copy. This is the metaphysic which uh, Plato tried to draw very um, with, with a lot of particularity in the, in the Republic. Here, I believe that from uh, Plato uh, onwards, philosophy has always wondered about the nature of art and has done so for the most part by expressing a great wonder about this nature. The question that philosophy has asked about art are many, not only what is art, which is a, a very classical and ontological question, but also think like why we are moved when we see a film, for example. Uh, even told we know that it is an invented story, or what is beauty, or what do we mean when we say, for example, that Masaccio's cru crucifixion is a beautiful painting. Uh, can, something, can something like a crucifixion be beautiful? Um, obviously not. So uh, it's necessary to understand that what, we, what we mean when we talk about uh, um, a beautiful properties of, uh, or a beautiful work of art. Since the beginning of the 20th century, as we all know very well, artists have modified their production in such a way as to some confuse it uh, with ordinary objects. Think, for example, we have a lot of examples in the contemporary uh, work of art. You, you, we, we may think to Duchamp or Duchamp, uh, yeah. Duchamp or Andy Warhol, for example. Uh, pretty everyone knows uh, the uh, one of the, the, the most iconic uh, works of art by uh, Warhol, like Brillo Boxes. Okay. Yes. Um, or the other tentative of the world, of the artist was that of uh, to of the materializing uh, work of art. Think, for example, to conceptual art. In all these circumstances, philosophy, especially the philosophy of art, has been called upon to try to offer some answer to the ontological puzzle that, despite themselves, artists were opening up. I think most people know the story, as, it, as we told before, the story of Marcel Duchamp uh, Fontaine. Do you, do you remember the object? Yes. Okay. Yes. That uh, that the common, very common artifacts, yes. which was bought uh, from uh, from uh, uh, from from a store in Manhattan. Well, the uh, young artist bought uh, a, a urinal, as I told, from a store in Manhattan, and without substantially changing any of his property. Uh, presented the, the objects, the artifact, to a competition for emerging artists. The response of the jury, uh, composed of the expert from the art world, th this is a, a very important point because the jury was made uh, essentially by uh, expert artists or art historian or journalist or people who was uh, working in the art world. Um, was to declare that that was the decision of the of the jury uh, to declare that Fontaine is not a work of art. We today consider Fontaine to be one of the iconic work of the 20th century. Well, how is possible? This is the uh, 
philosophical topic, the philosophical question behind this, uh, um, this event in the, in the art world. How is it possible that a mass produced objects of which very few properties have been alterated, a signature has been on the objects, uh, and the object has been uh, famous, famously uh, rotat rotated, can be considered as a work of art. How could all this happen? Well, philosophy has provided many explanations for this question, taking the exchange between the art and philosophy on a new level. Uh, then it must be said that to use a, a famous definition of the American philosopher Arthur Danto, art Art is an embedded meaning. If I believe Danto was right, as I believe, uh, it is clear that philosophy, with its millennial investigation, can provide a lot of material for the arts. Many of those embedded meaning of inspired artists. To go to to go back to China, uh, which was the topic of our first question, it is possible to refer to the production of the great Chinese artist Wang Wang Yi. Um, whose artistic path uh, basically reflect, reflect his great passion for philosophy. So, uh, to, to, uh, to, to say one word in order to, to, to finish this, this, uh, uh, this question, not only does philosophy uh, incessantly investigate art, continuously investigate art, but art is also constantly inspired by the works of philosophy. That of Wang Guangyi, the Wang Guangyi production is a very clear um, example to me. The relationship between art and philosophy is therefore already very strong and deep. Amazing, thank you. And um, I was wondering, have there been any cases in history where philosophy and art were seen, were more close? Rather um, than, you know, well, in contemporary art, where it is clearly needed. Uh, as, I, as I told at the beginning of uh, our conversation, um, it's, uh, uh, do you mean by the, the side of the artist, of the artistic production, or by the side of philosophy? Because uh, considering the spectrum of possibility art, possibility art um, yeah. but for example, the very classical tradition, Giotto, or also our master artist, use uh, philosophy and uh, uh, investigation about religion in order yes. to embody meaning, to embody notion and, and, and concept uh, in their artistic expression. Uh, the example, uh, the exam, the example uh, about uh, Masaccio and crucifixion uh, is clearly something like that. What do you see when you see um, uh, a, a painting with a, a, a mystical or religion topics? You see exactly um, arts and philosophy and religion that that are going together in order to made an offer a visual expression to a bundle of ideas that's uh, uh, so it's a part of our um, of the classical history of art the idea of taking part of philosoph philosophical investigation of religion investigation and as you know religion and philosophy um, usually got, goes go together, together yes. uh, in, in some in some particular kind of investigation and to have the ability of offering um, a visual a visual uh, um, mode of or a visual experience of that uh, um, I would say metaphysical and transcendental ideas yes perfect um, I'm gonna go with question number three which is um, so I watched now another interview, um, a speech you gave a few years ago um, about phil the philosophy of art. So we're still on this topic. Um, and you stated that you always try to provide the listener with the information um, mm -hmm. about contemporary art and what it is, uh, how uh, it started, why. 
but you try not to give your opinion on it and not to you try not to influence your audience but now i would like to know your opinion on contemporary art whether you prefer traditional art or contemporary art and and why uh and also um while it is clear that there are many differences between the two types of art what do you think are the uh, things they have in common instead mm -hmm. except you know being referred as art mm. um yeah uh yeah it's true i don't usually i don't uh, i don't like uh, uh to enter in in making um an aesthetic judgment or a personal opinion when i try to use artistic uh, example to make my uh analysis in in the ontological five field because uh in most of the cases when when i try to um discuss or to um uh to engage uh, something in, in the artistic field i try to uh, to be a philosopher and in and in my idea that's of uh, philosopher and and art art critics are two different two very um, different uh, uh kind of job okay this is the reason why i try to be philosophical and to have a philosophical uh, approach when i try to uh, to say something uh, about art. Um, that's because before making a, a judgment of test about art, and this is the other part, uh, uh, another part to, to complete your, your answer, your question, sorry. Um, before making a judgment uh, um, of test about art, I think it's appropriate for people to understand what they are uh, looking at, which is, it yes. seems uh, uh, normal, but it's 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 not the case, or it's not always the case, especially when we talk about uh, contemporary art. Uh, this this is my opinion. Uh, this is in my opinion is true for both traditional contemporary art. So the uh, the audience have to must try to become more most close from the cultural point of view. Uh, to the uh, works of art they are looking uh, for. Mind you, normally people think that they understand the Giotto painting uh, when they see uh, the, the, uh, a portrait or a painting in front of them, better than they think they understand, for example, a Cossut work. In my opinion, however, however this is a false impression. In order to understand art, all art, both traditionally and contemporary, certain things are necessary. And this is the, to explain some of these things as a part of the jobs that a philosopher must do. First of all, it is necessary to know the history, the cultural and the history of art. So general history, cultural history and more specifically history of art and then it is useful to be trained in artistic production uh, this is another uh, point that um, uh, usually people don't uh, um, don't have in mind when they try to um, to have um, an artistic experience to have a sensitivity, it's important to have a sensitivity to the composition of words, in case you read novel or, or try to write poems, um, to have sensitivity towards imaging of forms, uh, uh, in case you are looking and, and, uh, and at the painting, or uh, towards sa sounds. Very little in art is uh, improvised. It, uh, it's like... Um, writing when you find something this happens only after a long excavation of concepts and of words it takes a lot of words obviously uh, and it is uh, important to have in mind this contemporary art is no exception uh, although sometimes sometimes the opposite seems true uh, uh, usually um person uh, think something like, okay, this is not uh, a difficult job. It's possible for everyone um, 
to, to make works uh, of art. It is not true. Uh, now, to, to say something about the second part of your question. I am Italian and my artistic and aesthetic test has been, has been formed on the fine art and classical culture. Uh, and, 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 and I am quite happy uh, that this is so. However, I believe uh, as a philosopher that contemporary art um, has opened up new challenges to philosophy and that is why it is particularly interesting for a philosopher. So, to say in a word, I prefer classical art. Uh, I like classical tradition and, and Italian romanticism a, a lot. But as a philosopher, um, I really think that now the contemporary works of art uh, open and, 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 uh, and uh, open a lot of questions which, which are uh, really very intriguing from the philosophical point of view. This is the, one of the reasons um, for whom I decide to um, apply especially to, um, to contemporary art. Um, so, as a philosophy, the contemporary art has opened a as I told you, challenges to philosophy, and that is why it is particularly interesting to try to investigate uh, contemporary art. Uh, to answer the last part of your question, the one about uh, what traditional arts uh, and contemporary arts have in common, I would say uh, this. From my point of view, they have a lot in common, in the sense that I don't think it is necessary to overturn traditional ontology to explain contemporary art. It's not necessary to um, refound the ontology. It's necessary to rediscuss some key notion in ontology in order to explain also the contemporary art. As I have tried to explain uh, in my books, I think it is enough to expand the categories that we have already traditionally used to explain traditional art. For example, participatory arts require that the notion of authorship be expanded, while the conceptual art forces us to reformulate the notion of artistic medium. Within one of the central notions we use as a philosopher to explain both traditional and contemporary art. This is not to say that the medium is, that the medium is uh, in the conceptual art has disappeared. It means rather that we must conceptualize the notion of medium in a different way. Or to, to, to offer another example, again, con let us consider the notion of the art world, which is uh, uh, one of the uh, probably most used notion in the contemporary um, theories in order to explain some particular change in the um, in the, contemporary art, uh, in, in the contemporary art. It's a notion that philosophy was first produced by, uh, by Danto, Arthur Danto, the, the, the man uh, I, I have already cited in, in, in another, in another um, answer, in an essay uh, written in 1964. Well, it is certainly true that the notion of the artwork plays a fundamental role in explain, explaining contemporary art, as is uh, uh, noted by some theorists. Yet it is also true that traditional art in different historical eras have all experienced circulation within an artwork or an art market. It is a matter of comparing different worlds exploring concept, identify differences. In a world's work of art, uh, those more traditional and those that we typically ascribe to the category of contemporary art are social objects that incorporate a medium, uh, a meaning that is about something. So we use at least these, these three categories, medium, meaning, um, uh, and, and, and an artistic atmosphere, I would say, to explain uh, every kind of arts. 
Uh, this is my view. In my view, this is true uh, of art of all times. So we have a lot of uh, overlapping. And I think that uh, between traditional art and contemporary arts, and I think that one of the job that philosophy um, has to do is that, uh, is that of explaining how uh, these of overlapping function in some sense. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm gonna move on to question number four, uh, which is not really about art. And I'm gonna ask you, so throughout your life, you had the opportunity to collaborate with philosophers from so many different countries. And is I was wondering if the role of the philosopher is perceived differently among countries or, or roughly the same? And if it is perceived differently, what are the major differences? Yeah, that's um, another interesting question because it makes me to, to think about uh, the meaning of my, my job and of the, about the different way in which my job is uh, interpreted, interpreted in, in different parts of the world. And um, we know that uh, uh, to be a philosopher is declined in different uh, um, in different sense and with different uh, perspective. Um, indeed, philosophers interpret the intellectual work in different ways depending on culture, I would say, especially on culture to which they belong. On the European continent, uh, for example, many philosophers philosopher exercise a rule in a public debate, which is especially important uh, in the period, period of crisis like the one in which uh, we are. This means that they write in newspaper, participate in television talk show, uh, in cultural broadcast, like the one in which we are, you and me, <laughs> uh, now, and uh, uh, also in the political debate. In the Anglo-Saxon Anglo world, the situation is different, especially in the US. Uh, in the United States, philosophy, philosophers hardly have a rule in the public life of their countries, preferring to carry out their profession uh, within the universities and in a very restricted, specialized context. Okay, They don't like to have um, a rule. Yeah, a rule in the public debate or to, to be engaged in a public discussion. Um, and I think this is one of the most uh, uh, relevant uh, um, different, uh, not technical different, I would say. This depends not only on the way in which the figure of the intellectual and his rule is conceived uh, in those countries, but also on the way in which philosophy is developed. The analytic, uh, probably you know or you remember that uh, in the 20th century, especially uh, the tradition in, in philosophy split in uh, at least in the Western philosophy, because obviously in the uh, in the East tradition we 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 have to um, to to, uh, to to tell another story. Okay, which is. Uh, uh, a little more complicated, but in the analytic, in, in the Western tradition, we we have to remember at, at least two different um, sub tradition: the analytical one and the continental one. Uh, and the Great Britain, it's uh, um, it's 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 uh, usually it's a mix of of, of both. Uh, uh, so it's, it's in the middle in some sense. Um, so the analytic tradition that is uh, uh, prevalent in the English-speaking country generally is interested in developing, in developing research on topics that are less amenable to public discussion. There are internal differences with the um, different philosophical school, but I would say that these are more technical issues that have to do uh, primarily with the method and uh, uh, that with the method we adopt uh, when doing research. In general, we say that it seemed to me useful, especially in a period in which democracies show important fragility due to a great many factors from expected one like technological change to unforeseen, 
one like pandemic, um, that philosophers strive both to bring philosophy into the public debate and to enter the public debate by exer ex exercising reason in non-specialized and public context, which is one of the this is one of the uh, most uh, most important job that philosophers do for the uh, um, society and public opinion, I would say. Uh, after all, one of the tasks, perhaps the main task of philosophy, is precisely to examine important questions and problems on the basis of justified arguments. In other words, is, it consists in examining a problem, an issue, or a minor question of life by exercising reason. So, uh, if you interpret uh, this like one of the most important uh, uh, constraints of philosopher, I think that it's it's in, uh, that we I, I I mean for we uh, in in Europe. Uh, in the in which we have the both tradition, the continental and the analytic one, but uh, uh, in a situation in which the philosopher usually try to um, engage with important topic in and, and with the public opinion, we are doing the um, a, a good thing uh, in uh, in every situation in which we try to enter in the public debate to ex to, to talk with the students not only in the um, university but also in a much more broad context and to uh, help people in exercising reason to support uh, good reason to take a uh, decision uh, in, most, in, in, in important uh, topic. Uh, so, which is the difference? We, we in Europe, uh, we, we try to have a public uh, rule, public rule. Uh, in the US, uh, usually no. Uh, and, uh, and I think at the end of the day, we are right. Great. <laughs> uh, yeah, I do agree with you. And uh, now, Let's look back at your career and I'm going to ask you, is there anything you would have done differently in your <laughs> career? And I'm going to let you ask, answer this question and continue with the other ones first. Um, I, I feel a little bit old because of your question, I would say. Um, but I would say at the end of the day, no. Um, no, because uh, obviously, the, 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 of course, uh, you you uh, you can always do better. But on on the other end, as for um, I, I would say that uh, the most important choices in my career was uh, was done in a correct uh, in a correct way, and that and also that there is no so difference today compared to the past. So no. For, for for answer to no the first part. No, no, great. no. I, <laughs> I'm quite happy. That's great. Um, so if you were 20 years old now during a mm. pandemic and one of the biggest economic crises ever, do you think you would have made the same choices or you would have taken a different, a slightly different path? Um, no, because uh, um, because I think that the world during the pandemic changed partially. This is true, but the way in which uh, a scholar have to imagine um, the general way of organizing uh, his life, uh, his professional life, I mean, probably changed. Uh, I would say ten years ago, fifteen years ago. Uh, when the uh, possibility of uh, improving the mobility in general uh, really changed the way we uh, a scholar orga organize his formation. Um, but I think that uh, uh, it's uh, that's that that is something in which to which we are confident from. Uh, uh, from a while this is not something which uh, um, which which makes uh, uh, which which is entirely new now 
Um, the increasing of mobility uh, is something which became, became evident uh, 15, 10 years ago, I think. Um, I, I, I would say, I would offer an example. Um, a young PhD now has the opportunity to improve his professional career around in the world. My, my PhD students here in Italy then moves to US to have um, uh, a short or long, it depends on the subjects, uh, period of formation in, in one of the um, American university and they can switch uh, during the same period uh, of formation in uh, China, for example. Because there, as, you, as I told you before, uh, you can find some of the um best uh, uh, best uh, best university um in the world so they can uh, my my student can can uh, um can study in europe can study in uh, they have the possibility to improve their formation in us and in china and this is a, uh this is great for a formation of uh, um for for the tenure track or the formation of a young researcher. It's a great opportunity. And I hope that this not change after the pandemic. Uh, this is a period of crisis. It's, it's, it's true, we are all in the front of uh, a video, making call, <laughs> making debate or, um, but, but, but uh, I think that, I hope that uh, we will enter in, in uh, come back to our regular life uh, in short, uh, and that there is a, there is a thing that I uh, I hope that will uh, be um, maintained also after this pandemic period, uh, and it is the possibility of having conferences, for example, a workshop or meeting using also technologies, because uh, um, uh, if you think uh, technology. Uh, is um, can be can can become a, a very good instrument of democratization. Think, for example, of uh, those students or those PhD who live uh, um, uh, in the BRICS country. I mean, in the country of South uh, America or uh, uh, of the poor country. Using internet, they can have the possibility to enter in the. Um, in the in the large community of the scholar uh, uh, without any barriers. So I hope that sure. this will remain because this is a great advance in democratization. But I also hope uh, that uh, the person will have again the possibility of uh, moving seeing around the world, seeing the, each other and yeah. traveling because traveling and start to have the possibility of uh, of stayed for a period abroad. I spent uh, part of my life in US and as well in China, as well in other European car countries, is an incredible and enriching experience. So I would say to my scholar, uh, okay, um, go away, go, go ab abroad, uh, um, choose uh, um, a guide in your um, track of uh, formation, in your path. Do you remember Dante? Dante uh, met Virgilio at yeah. the very beginning of his trip, and he was his guide. So a poet wo was guided by another poet uh, along a, an incredible trip. So my suggestion is uh, find a good guide. Because, good Virgilio. Uh, a good Virgilio, a good philosopher, a philosopher who who is able of uh, of making the the intelligent question, the most innovative question? Who is able of uh, doing research in an in an no, in innovative way? Who has an international profile? Uh, and then go, go and 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 try to try to travel, try to be curious, and try to um, to be uh, uh, careful and and uh, and passionate in in, in studying. It's an, an incredible uh, possibility that of uh, uh, making research, uh, um, teachings to students, to students, and 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 uh, and, uh, and asking uh, continually question about uh, 
uh, our experience of living. So uh, good luck. But these are <laughs> these are these are my most important suggestions. Yeah, I I agree. Um, we are tired of being in this situation, but there are also advantages. Um, yes. Yeah, but we'll... and you 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 have to to remain happy because things I think uh, uh, will come back uh, quite yes. quick quite quickly, and uh, and then we have to uh, maintain the the what we have learned from technology, and then go back back again to our to our life. Yes, integrate it a bit more than it was before, but still going back to yeah. how it was. Exactly. Yes. Um, okay. Now, um, and let's talk about your one of the, your latest works on transgenerationality. Um, yeah. You've just Beautiful released the words. book. Yeah, <laughs> especially in English. <laughs> and yes, so you released the book in twenty twenty. And could you give us a short overview of what transgenerational responsibility is? And yeah. I'm gonna let you answer this question first and then move on. Yeah, um, a difficult word, uh, uh, they say, uh, uh, also in Italian. Uh, yes. <laughs> first of all, <laughs> first of all uh, perhaps it is uh, helpful to say a word about what transgenerationality is because it's not a co so common sensical word. Uh, I define trans, I and, 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 and scholar who works on transgenerationality. Uh, I define transgenerationality as the bond that means generation throughout history. You see, one of the fundamental questions internal to philosophical political reflection concerns the way in which our society are legitimate and stable entity. Transgenerationality has to do with, uh, especially with stability, that is with the fact that uh, in a social system, generations follow one another over time, allowing the social system to endure, that is to avoid power vacuums or worse, anarchies. The problem of stability is an um, an issue close to the heart of political philosophers since Hobbes. Now, in this framework, it is necessary to pay attention above all to, especially to two things. First, to the fact that the, uh, in principle, the human beings, uh, the human beings is naturally inclined to transgenerationality. At least this is my opinion. Uh, I would like to say that before being a political animal, Perhaps you remember the very famous definition by Aristotle that human beings are political animals. Okay, so before being um, political animals, uh, uh, human beings are transgenerational animals, in my view. They have, they have, uh, in fact, built culture, languages. They have elaborated scientific research, uh, and they produce art, as we told before. All these activities are intrinsically transgenerational since they produce a legacy in terms of culture or of scientific research that one generation transmits to the generation that will uh, follow. On the other hand, we must also reflect on the fact that uh, there are social actions that have intrinsically transgenerational characteristics. These, uh, in simple words, mean that there are actions that, uh, in order to be carried out, require, require the necessary cooperation between different generations. And this is, I would say, uh, the thing that you have to remember about transgenerationality. We are being, as human beings, one generation uh, with the other, and we made, in some circumstances, a particular uh, kind of action which endure uh, a lot over the time, which have a sort of perduration, which is quite long. And why this is uh, interesting? Because uh, this kind of action require necessary, it's not an option, but is a necessity, the cooperation, the mutual cooperation between different generations. Okay. Um, and this generation are not in uh, 
um, on the same plane, they are not in a, a relation of reciprocity uh, because uh, uh, some took the decision about the necessity of doing this action, the other not. <laughs> The other can have a choice, but are in uh, are put in, in in the middle of the transgenerational action, and and they have just to finish this kind of action. Um, that's obviously uh, this is of course is a, a a loaded point for a lot of ethical and practical reason. And um, how can the law help in in improving the Microenvironment of future generations. What well, what can be done, and how long do you think it will be before regulations and guidelines will be made on, on this uh, field? Uh, yeah, in, uh, in Italy, I mean, ah, uh, in Italy and all over in the Italy. world, because uh, yeah. and all over the world, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's it's a, a, a very central problem, not only for Italy. For Italy. Uh, especially because uh, we have a particular problem in organizing our future um, and the future of future generation. Uh, but it's, I think it's a problem central for the Western society uh, in general. Um, so the second part of your question is especially born with uh, mm, the notion of responsibility on, on the side and on the, notion, on the problem of the practical um, practical uh, uh, consequence and, and a practical decision we have to take in order to to put things on the right path because uh, to me uh, and for the and to most of the scholars who are engaged with the question of transnationality things are not actually on the right path um, transgenerational responsibility trans responsibility uh, Emerge from the um, from the thing I tried to explain before. Uh, it's emerged from the realization uh, that the future, or rather the action of the generation that will come after us, are necessary for our happiness and are necessary for the maintains for the maintenance of our well-being. If this is true, as I believe uh, it is we cannot exempt ourselves from taking responsible transgenerational action. That is, we cannot avoid considering future generations as subjects of rights as well as duty. But, uh, but the, your question is also practical. How can the law help in improving the macro environment of the future generation? I think Western democracy need to think about few things all Western democracy, not only Italy. First, how to define individual freedom and the boundaries that freedom should have, which is a critical point uh, also in the pandemic, I would say. Um, then perhaps it is useful to ask ourselves if radical individualism has not show important limits to include future generation in our cultural and economic models means thinking of a society not as a series of individuals, each of whom is committed to achieving his own maximum profit, but as flow of individuals who succeeded one another in time, committed to entering into an activity of incessant modeling of the future. We have to uh, model and to orient the future. Uh, our future and the future of future generations. This is a cooperative activity in which human beings are constantly engaged in a free and equal way. An equal way. I believe that in a model of this kind, states, this is to answer your very last point, or large association of states, like for example, European community, must, must play a fundamental rule since they can guarantee the normative framework for the realization of transgenerational action. Or better, uh, they can ensure through the implementation of uh, appropriate fiscal, economic, and 
de development policies that the rights of the future generation are protected. How to do all this uh, is a technical problem that we cannot address here, but if you ask me who, in terms of ontological entity, should do it, that is, which political entity should take care of it, take care of it, I answer you, the states. Because states are the entities that cross generation and time and ensure that societies endure. Governments, as we know, often find it difficult to withstand the disruption caused by public opinion. In other words, governments have, in a lot of cases, uh, obvious difficulties, especially under ordinary conditions, in setting long-term policies that take into account the interest of future generations. So I think that the planetary crisis generated by pandemic can be an extraordinary opportunity to put things on the right track. After all, the recovery plan launched by the European community is called Next Generation EU. The European community is taking on the responsibility through the operational arm of the uh, nation states to direct the future for us and for the next generation. This is a great challenge, especially for a country like Italy that is not used to directing its future and, the, and that of the next generation. We don't like to do this, uh, um, this job. So short how long term. can... Uh, <laughs> it's more yes, like short term. term. Yeah, yeah. So uh, in, in a national, uh, I think that the next four or five years will be the critical period in order to change the direction. And if we will not able to change the direction, uh, for we, I mean, Western society, not only Italy, because as I told yeah. you, probably US, which, which have a very high uh, private debt, for example, we know that the, the question of debt, you know, as economists, that the prob problem of debt is one of the most critical transgenerational question we have today in the Western society. Uh, yes. If we, we don't, we're not able to change the direction in the next uh, four or five uh, years, I think that the sustainability of our society will be at risk. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, okay, I'm gonna move on to the last question um which is um i read in a newspaper an interview you you gave and you stated that can't believe that a generation would have added something more into the next one and uh you seem to think that it's true as well um and however this process stopped or it slowed down and in some cases, it actually went backwards, like with the environment or pensions, for example. And what do you think this happened and what can be done to restart the process <laughs> again, especially in, in this very uncertain situation where we're currently living? Yeah. Yeah, partially uh, we we have already something about uh, this topic, which is very connecting to the previous uh, question. Uh, yeah. But yes, you are right. This is the idea that you mentioned before in your your, your question. Is the idea that uh, Kant formulates formulates in his uh, political writing, and it was actually quite uh, whispered and shared. In short, this the idea. Is, uh, is this apart from the first generation that would have uh, uh, decided to give life uh, to the social contracts, which obviously should be considered as a, a mere regu um, regulatory hypothesis, all the others would have done something from the previous, previous generation. That is, they would have benefited from those who preceded them. Um, indeed, we said earlier that human progress derives from the ability and the habit of human beings to engage in transgenerational practices. I say that we 
uh, in my idea, human beings are not only political animals, but they are um, especially transgenerational animal. Yes. Uh, and we have a lot of these uh, uh, example of uh, our um, ability to be to being transgenerational, transgenerational such, such as development of scientific knowledge, artistic production, but also education. Uh, what emerges today are what I call the stumbling blocks of transgenerationality, that is a long or very long human action that require the necessary collaboration between different generations, but do not respect the constraints of transgenerational equity or equality. There are many examples such as public debt, climate change, uh, imbalances in welfare policies also. Why this is happening? Essentially, I think, because uh, I believe that for several decades, we have been going through a historical phase in which we tend to exploit the future um, instead of directing it by making decisions that are fair and respectful of the rights of future generations. In a world, we use the future in terms of climate and environment research or trust. For example, we expect future generations to pay the debt uh, that we have contract just as well, uh, just as we wait to pay the debt uh, um, that our fathers have contracted, without asking ourselves whether society society has been set, set up in the right way. In other words, we have realized that the future is a resource, is something that we can use that can be used in different ways to make our present better. So we exploit it without asking ourselves too many questions. The point is that we have uh, reached a point, at least in my opinion, where this attitude emerges as clearly problematic. As I have already mentioned, the strategy that seems to me the most appropriate to change things are basically three. First of, all, first of all, to recognize that we have a problem with transgenerationality. This is a part of the job, as uh, we discussed uh, uh, before, um, uh, is in charge, I think, mostly uh, to philosophy. So we have to recognize the problem with transgenerationality, and we have to describe it, discussing uh, the reason, and discussing um, reason of this situation with the specialist on a side and with the, in, a, in a public public context on the other side. Then we have to reflect on the problematic uh, nature of the world's view center on a fundamentally and radically individualistic conception of uh, um, individual and individual individuality. And finally, uh, we have to return to give centrality to the states and to those institutions that by nature have the function of guaranteeing transgenerational balances. Uh, humanity is interconnected throughout history. We are not only uh, connected to our past throughout memory, it is quite uh, uh, recognized, commonly recognized, but we are also connected to the future throughout the action we take to orient the future. Of this, in my opinion, we need to become uh, much more aware and we have also tried to um, figure out political uh, action in order to, to, to move this idea from the uh, theoretical vision, from the theoretical plan to the uh, concrete political practice, yes. Yes. Uh, do you think the pandemic um, has fastened this process, has made people more aware that the, futures, the future needs could, to be considered as well, not only the past, but also we can act in the present to change the future? I hope so. I hope so. I'm quite convinced so, because, uh, um, for example, the... Um, the idea that we have to invest uh, 
um, in in a scientific research, uh, in in a scientific research, much and in university and in development yeah. and research, much more, especially in Italy. Especially, this is very true for Italy because for other con contexts like uh, China, as we mentioned before, uh, this is the practical. Um, and, and the daily decision which are taken by the government, the, the Chinese government is deeply uh, concerned with the future and, and, and put the money in research and development a lot. This is also true for the US, obviously, not as much as China, but it is also true for for uh, for US. For uh, our country, I hope that uh, people because obviously to have the public opinion on the right side is a great part of the job because public opinion obviously have a great influence of the government, not on the states, but on the government. So if the public opinion push uh, in order to put money, public money in public investment, in order to save our future and the future of our son, um, a good part of a, of a job is done. Then we have to think about the technicalities. Uh, as economists, for example, you can suggest how is it possible to just saving, to, to, to do a, a current just saving um, to, to, to reinforce our future. And as philosopher, we can uh, also express ethical ideas yes. uh, about part of the society who have to be in charge, especially of this. But the first action that we have to uh, to take is that of uh, explaining to public opinion that if we want that our that our society remain a sustainable society, we have to be um, concerned with our future, and we have to uh, try to orient our future in a completely different way, as before pandemic. Amazing. Um, hopefully, yeah, things will, will actually change. Um, that's the end of the interview. I'd like to thank you for, for being here today. And for, thank you for the hospitality. Of course, it was a great pleasure to, to, to talk about some of the topics you're um, uh, a specialist at. And uh, Yes, so I would say uh, goodbye to everyone and thank you again, Professor and Dina, for, for being here tonight. It's a pleasure. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Goodbye, guys. Good luck. Good luck to thank everyone you. and to all of students who was watching. Thank you. Thank you.